So this is the video I announced in my latest short community post. I had a light bulb moment yesterday thinking about John 4 again, as it relates to the concept of confession. I don't know if y'all caught the point I was making reading the post, but it was supposed to be a teaser only anyway, to be elaborated on in the video, so here we go. In 99% of the cases, the word confess is being interpreted and taught in the sense that one must name each individual sin before God in order to receive forgiveness. This teaching is based on 1 John 1 9, regardless of the fact that this is not the meaning of that word in the Greek. And all those who have been to Bible school or seminary and have received a pastoral education know that. There are two groups, those that teach that an unbeliever must confess their sins before God in order to get saved. But then there are those who call themselves free grace and they say, no, salvation is by grace through faith alone. You get saved simply by believing the gospel as it is defined in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4. Nothing else is required. However, when it comes to living the Christian life, they all of a sudden handle the confession topic differently and claim that confession is necessary in order to get back into fellowship with God, which, according to them, can be lost by sinning, and in order to get back into the light, they say, you end up in darkness each time you sin. Now, this is inconsistent hermeneutics, of course. Confession does not mean one thing for an unbeliever and another for a believer. If you want to know how this word is defined in the true scriptural sense, and if the common interpretation of 1 John 1 9 is actually correct, please check out my video that has this verse in the title. Let us go over to the account of Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well and find out how the concept of confession is used here. That's John 4. Let's read from verse 16. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. Let's have a closer look at this part of the conversation. According to the general definition of the word, the woman would have to confess, that is, cite all her sins. But what is happening here? Jesus gives her a cue. He asks her to call her husband. She answers, I have no husband. Now, while this was her, ac while this was her accurately describing her current situation, she wasn't actually revealing more than necessary. It could have meant all sorts of things. She could be a widow or never have gotten married at all. Now look at how the conversation continues. How would those with a false concept of confession have continued the story? In many a church, after an altar call, you are expected to go to a member of the prayer team lined up at the podium and confess all the sins that come to mind in order to receive forgiveness and get saved. So, according to this model and understanding of confession, the woman would now have had to give a detailed list of all her sins. We don't know what exactly the reason was for the fact that she had had five marriages and was living with a sixth man. Obviously, as a woman back then, you needed a man to be cared for materially. Maybe the other husbands simply sent her away, divorced her. But let's assume for a moment that she had a share in all of this as well. Then her confession would have to have sounded something like, I stayed with my first husband for an X amount of time until I cheated on him with the one who then became my second husband and then, and so on. Instead, what happens is that Jesus is the one who tells her her whole sinful life story in one sentence. This has the effect that the woman realizes she is known by him. 
She does not object, nor does she try to justify herself. But what this does, as we see a little later, is it shows her that the one she is talking to must be the long-awaited Messiah. The interpretation of the word confess comes from 1 John. In the epistle, John warns of those he calls antichrists. The two verses that frame verse 9 in the first chapter state the following. Verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The Antichrists deny that they have sin. If the woman had belonged to that category, she would have maybe answered something like, well, we are as good as married, we are already making plans, or simply, yes, I'll go get him, his name is... Jesus, however, attests to her that she said well and spoke the truth. She does not deny that his observation and judgment is true. Fast forward to what happened after Jesus revealed to her that he was the Messiah. The woman goes into the city and tells everyone, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And a few verses later we read, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all that I ever did. Now, do you notice something? This is exactly the other way around of what the prevalent teaching has made it to be. It was not the woman who confessed her sins to Jesus. She did not tell the people, I told him everything I ever did and he forgave me. But Jesus told her all her sins, by it showing her that he is the Christ, the Messiah. No random stranger could have known these details. Nor did Jesus tell her, Okay, now you've got to confess all your sins one by one, then you can be forgiven and will be eligible for receiving the living water. However, there is the element of confession in this story. Again, like I explained in the video I have mentioned, confess in the Greek is homologeo. Homos means same and lego to speak. So, this word means literally to speak the same thing, be in accord with someone, to agree with someone. Let us go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, for a moment. And let's keep in mind that we are dealing with the same author here who also wrote the epistles. John the Baptist is being asked who he is. We read, He confessed, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. He is in agreement with Christ that he is not the Christ, but Jesus is. But notice the peculiarity here. What we have here is a synonym of confess embedded in the repeated statement, he confessed. It says, he confessed and did not deny. Just like repent and believe the gospel, which is one and the same action, confess and not deny are synonyms. This is added for emphasis here. John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wanted to make it very clear that John the Baptist was indeed not the Christ. Now, the Antichrists who are described in John's epistle are among those who deny. They deny that they have sin. With this in mind, let us read the confession verse of 1 John 1, 9 in the context of the verses that surround it, and I'll comment on each verse. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. My comment, those are the Antichrists, unbelievers. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My comment, those are they who do not deny that they have sinned. They agree with God's judgment on themselves, 
which, again, is the meaning of the word confess. What did Jesus say to the Samaritan woman? You spoke truly. This confession, that is agreement, the not denying and believing on Jesus for salvation, is what gets us saved. Now verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My comment, here we have the deniers again. Denying means not confessing. Again, what it means is a general agreement with the fact that one is a sinner and, as such, in need of salvation. John the Baptist confessed a truth. He admitted that he was not the Christ. This has nothing to do with enumerating sins. We see that also in 1 John 4, verse 15, and I made a video about this, where it says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Confess here does not mean naming your sins one by one in order to receive forgiveness. Nor does this verse mean that you have to confess, that is, speak out loud, that Jesus is the Son of God each day in order to abide in God. In the same way, confessing does not mean a repeated citing of sins either. What it means here is an agreement, a believing in the truth that Jesus is in fact the Son of God. And this is exactly what the Antichrists described in the epistle do not do. They are characterized by denial. In chapter 2, verse 22, we read, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Here we see those who do not confess, that is, deny, that is, are not in agreement with God's testimony about his Son, as we read in chapter 5, verse 10, he who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. The effect of a teaching of introspection, that is, the attempt to identify all sins that could possibly be there, is actually a depressive mood, a feeling of condemnation. But, as we have seen here in the story, this was not the result of Jesus' encounter with a Samaritan woman. She went, or better ran, back into town, forgot her water pot, and enthusiastically told everyone that she had met the Christ, that is, Messiah. Jesus had uncovered her sinful life, but this didn't lead to self-condemnation. It made her aware that all her sinful past had not brought any lasting satisfaction. It was actually freeing to her not having to hide all her history. She was not in denial. She agreed with Jesus' diagnosis, which made her realize that she was in fact in need of that living water he offered her. It also made clear that she was indeed having a supernatural encounter. Just like Jesus had said, he was the Messiah. Jesus offered the living water to her without any obligation on her part. She didn't have to pay for it by sin confession, a certain degree of remorse, or anything of that nature. All she did was agree with his observation of her spiritual condition. Indeed, she was a sinner, she was lost, and needed Messiah. God has a sense of humor. He knew already 2,000 years ago that we would be up against a predominant teaching, of Catholic origin really, that says that we have to constantly name every individual sin that comes to mind in order to receive forgiveness, even if it is quote-unquote only for fellowship or so-called familial forgiveness. So he worked the contrast to this Galatianized version of forgiveness into this account. Instead of the woman saying, I told him everything I ever did, scripture records her saying the opposite, he told me all that I ever did. Isn't that something? What this is telling us is that he knows us. 
we cannot hide, and, better than that, we do not have to hide, and he offers his living water truly without any condition. It is free, without cost. Yes, we confess and do not deny. He is the Christ. He told us everything we ever did. We agreed with his judgment and got saved. And he knows everything we do, but he does not count our sins against us anymore. He paid the price so that we would not have to. The gospel is indeed good news. It gives us the diagnosis of our condition, but at the same time offers us God's life, the living water. This living water is without cost and is not retracted every time we sin until we name all our sins. That would mean that we would be without that living water all the time because we still sin until we get our glorified bodies. Remember, it's not just outwardly visible sins. But what did Jesus tell the Samaritan woman? Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So here we have yet another account in the Bible where confession does not mean citing all one's individual sins. If this were so, the woman would have said, I told him everything I ever did, but as it is, it was the other way around. Now you could object, this is a conversion story, but 1 John 1 9 is addressing believers. As I have shown here and in other videos and posts, however, this is not the case. It addresses unbelievers. Also, it, it makes no difference for the practice. As we have seen, a detailed naming of each individual sin is not what confession means. It means being in agreement with God on the diagnosis that one is a sinner. This general agreement is not being negated by the believer. He knows he is a sinner, but saved. He does not, like some heretical teaching that exists out there, deny that he still has sin. However, he also knows that his life is now hidden with Christ in God and that Christ is his justification. God remembers our sins no more. The living water is not being withheld from us until we quote unquote confess. Jesus said we shall never thirst. We can drink at any time on the basis of what Christ accomplished for us, never on the basis of anything we would have to offer. We must offer Christ. 